And so like we have this uh, slightly longer video, Thomas Sowell, where they, they sort of turn it into an animation. So like it, that wasn't childlike enough for you. Um, now we're going to turn it into a little fucking cartoon for the uh, uh, three-year-olds that are watching this. <laughs> Listen to that music. My little pony needs... Uh, I guess the first thing to do is to def define what cosmic justice is as distinguished from whatever other kind of justice uh, we may be familiar with. Uh, traditional justice, I guess we can summarize, at least in the American uh, tradition, as applying the same rules and the same standards to everybody. Cosmic justice is very different. It means equalizing the prospects of everybody. No and, I mean, even in this distinction, he says this is like the classical American tradition of traditional justice applying the same rules and standards to everybody. How is this possibly true? Like, what in American history makes you think that this is a valuable way of discussing all this, right? Like, it's just clearly not true, right? We don't have the same rules and standards to everybody, not now, not then. Equalizing the prospects of everybody. This is not dealing with the physical world, materially physical. This is metaphysics. Yeah. And the and the phrase that he uses, the cosmic, right? He's trying to denigrate it just by doing this kind of silly mislabel. Those two things are not only different in concept, they are wholly incompatible with one another. If you apply the same rules and standards to everybody in baseball, Mark McGuire is going to hit but, 70 but hey, home you know, runs. Take a look at it. His, his equal outcome thing, he has the line going down so that he's starting out his cosmic justice unequally. They yeah. end up equal outcome. But but he, he it's so ingrained in his mind, he doesn't even notice that that he he I mean this this is probably his representation of what he thinks reality is because because you know if you go from left to right they they start from ten yard ten yard dash forty yard dash sixty yard dash hundred yard dash equal outcome well if you're gonna start people like that you you better damn well equal equalize it because why did you just start someone at a hundred yards when you started at ten yards so I mean yeah. he doesn't even seem to realize. I mean, that's such a, speaking of Freudian, getting back to the, the last douche we talked about, I mean, it, that's a Freudian slip if I ever saw one. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's going to be more prominent as this goes on. There are going to be other people who will spend an entire career without hitting 70 home runs, including people in the Hall of Fame like Luke Appling, who twice won the batting championship. So if you want the one thing or the other, you can go for it. But the one thing you cannot do is pursue the two things simultaneously. Or rather, you cannot successfully do that. I mean, I think you can do it successfully, and you should pursue uh, both simultaneously. I wouldn't quite frame it in the way that he's doing it, but, you know, as far as, far as like a general principle, uh, you know, like I, I've said this before, but we clearly have in this country, right, uh, unequal consequences for equal behavior. Um, if I am going to... Uh, um, you know, like, like if a white person sells drugs, uh, just definitionally, right, they're, they're going to be uh, on average uh, having to deal with um, just like less issues when it comes to law enforcement, right? Uh, they're probably going to get uh, caught less often because just by virtue of being white, you know, they're going to be patted down less. They're going to be uh, suspected less. Um, you know, that that is, a, that is a kind of inequality, right? You're, you're doing the same kind of misdeed but the consequences for it are very, very different, right? That's not acceptable, right? In terms of the conservative psychology, and if you really do want this kind of, uh, you know, uh, thing where like you, you, you're not, you're not going to punish people, to, you know, that, that's like another way of framing it, right? Like if you're so against this idea of different standards for different people, how do you deal with the fact that? Uh, depending on who you are, where you live, where you're born, what you look like, what you have in your bank account. It's different consequences for different, uh, for identical strings of behaviors, right? Even like other examples, like, uh, you know, like with like abortion. Um, if you don't have, if you're not able to get an abortion versus uh, a woman that is able to get an abortion, your life be getting pregnant at 15 is going to look very different. And that's not, you know, that that's obviously not acceptable. Um, you can't, you, you, you can't have a society uh, that doesn't like, you know, just like break at the seams 
if it's going to be unequal consequences for identical strings of behaviors. Supreme Court has been pursuing the two things simultaneously for quite a, quite a while, leading to a lot of five to four decisions uh, and inconsistent decisions. The five to four decisions come from the fact that either Republicans or Democrats at any given year are the ones putting forward these justices. It's a political it's not a it's not a it's not a fucking question of legality. What are we talking about? Like go back to some of those judgments. Go back to Plessy versus Ferguson. Look at the uh what is it, Harlan, the, the famous Harlan dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson. And then compare uh the unanimous decision in Brown versus Board of Ed. Are you telling me me that what happened was like like people suddenly understood the legal world better? Judges became more wise. No, all that happened was the society that these judges were born in is not the society uh, a century later that other judges are born into. That's all it is. The requirements for the two kinds of justice are very different. The requirement for treating everyone the same is very simple. It's mass produced. The requirements for cosmic justice must be handmade and tailored to each individual case. It's much more complex. And what is what is traditional justice? Like he just he's just making up phrases. Like this is not traditional. He's just making this up. It requires a much larger amount of government power. Some third party Ooh. must intervene to determine whether the outcomes are right, whether the prospects are right. The very same words have entirely different meanings within these two frameworks. In fact, as I mentioned in the preface to the book, what really set me off a few years ago to finish it up was a discussion with one of my colleagues at Stanford University, who shall be anonymous in deference to the libel laws, <laughs> uh, who talked about a level playing field. And it became plainly clear that what he called a level playing field is what I would have called a tilted playing field. Tilted so as to produce the results that he wanted. Well, what he's recommending is also a tilted playing field, except it's, you know, the results need to be more in line with the status quo, right? Like, it's just like this, it's such a, you know, like, I don't know, I don't know if, if it's propaganda. I don't know if it's like, to what extent people literally just don't understand the meanings of basic words. But I mean, come on, like, you know, like, like, like e either way that you slice it, you could say one thing is tilted. You could say the other thing is tilted. I'm going to I'm going to assume that he was in charge of whoever the cartoonist was, but if he clearly believes in a tilted playing field, as I said, he had the he had the left to right going like that. So mm -hmm. I mean, he, he believes in it, even if he's subconsciously doesn't even recognize that he's tilting the playing fields. Mm -hmm. Feel tilted so as to produce the results that he wanted. When we talk about a fair fight, that means very different things in these two within these two frameworks. A uh, fair fight by traditional standards means that both boxers observe the Marcus of Queensberry rules. And the fight is fair whether it ends up in a draw or one-sided beating. From the other point of view, from the cosmic perspective, it's fair only when the two fighters enter the ring with the same prospects of winning. Uh, John Rawls has... That, but that, that's literally how boxing is. You're not going to put a 300-pound heavyweight against a you know 120 pound boxer he yeah. he like this is this is like the worst example that i could think of and he's doing it he doesn't even understand that he's doing it literally what he's describing when it comes to something like boxing is we have you know we don't have like that's the thing we, you're never going to get perfect equality we don't do boxing matches based on okay he weighs 140 pounds and a, and a half and he needs to weigh 140 pounds and a half right we don't do shit like that right it's gonna be like within a, a, a an acceptable range and you know very well that if the because if you fall even a little bit outside that range like you know a 10 pound difference or a 15 pound difference a 20 pound difference be, specifically because like when we're talking about something like boxing you know years and years of training these are not random people from the street we're talking about years of training years of diet right years of watching other things like years of making sure that you know uh your weight uh stays a certain way uh that you don't get injured right it was certain certain kind of directions and patterns so you know in, in a very kind of essential way the only reason why a boxing match would be interesting is two boxers show up and they are already more or less equal okay 
anything other than that, that's not an interesting match anymore. It's going to be, you know, what he described earlier, which is just like, you know, a ter- total like bludgeoning. Granted, like you could you could have, you know, two equally ma- matched boxers and you could have one that totally dominates. But, you know, um, uh, uh, we, we, we basically set up the exact thing that he says that we should not be doing. He uses the worst possible example. Um, and like, like nobody, nobody's like calling him out on it. I doubt if there was like a, a, this is based on some lecture. I doubt if there was a question and answer session, anybody was even like able to like, you know, pick up on how horrible this example was. Yeah. Well, that's why you have weight classes. That's why Muhammad Ali never fought, uh, you know, uh, Roberto Duran or, or Sugar Ray Robinson. Uh, yeah. Uh, or even like in like smaller case, I, I don't know how, how true this is, but like, you know, I, I heard for instance that um, Floyd Mayweather, you know, I, I don't know how true this is, but he, he's been accused of being very selective in terms of the boxers that he fights. Meaning, you know, obviously they're always, they're always going to be within his weight class, but he probably, you know, let's say that he has the ability to pick and choose in that way. You know, e- even when you get like on that level of analysis, right, there's all these like finer distinctions that you could make and all this like decision making that does tilt the playing field in ways that you don't want. And it's quite counter to everything that's that uh, he's arguing for here. As, uh, well, boxing man- boxing so- managers have done that. It's called fighting tomato cans. Joe Lewis had his bum of the month because he'd fight mm-hmm. once a month and he'd, he'd, he'd fight against, uh, you know, a, a, a terrible fight on his way down or a youngster that didn't have a chance. That's all. I, that's to maximize the, maximize the money to add, you know, 10 or 12 knockouts to someone's record to, to make them more money, um, mm-hmm. you know, but. Summarized and epitomized of these two differences. He distinguishes what he calls fair equality of opportunity from merely formal equality of opportunity. Uh, traditional justice or fairness by Rawls' standards means simply that people are, are judged by the same rules. But genuine equality of opportunity, as he calls it, cannot be achieved by this, uh, by this method. Instead, he says, undeserved inequalities call for redress. Uh, and obviously someone must have power in order to do that redress. Yeah, we have that power now and people are making those decisions now and they're going to continue making these decisions. The question is, what kind of decisions do we want? A genuine equal opportunity cannot be achieved by, by play, judging by the same rules. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, let's try it first. I mean, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, like a, uh, this, anyway, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Now, what's called, what I call cosmic justice has been called by some people social justice. But I think they're unduly modest because they're trying to correct not only the inequities that they see in society, they're trying to to correct the oversights of God or the defects of the cosmos. When some people are born uh, with physical or mental handicaps, they want to counterbalance that. And of course, that's not always caused by society. So that when Moral says that undeserved inequalities, he includes all sorts of things. And that, that opens up a very large area. How, how could somebody like making this cartoon, like literally put this down and think, huh, I think he's making a lot of sense here. How could he watch a race like this and think that this is acceptable? Like, yeah. h- how are you like not making the other side of the argument about putting this kind of picture together? The, yeah, it's just it's just so weird to like watch something something like this and like there's there's nothing that goes off in the video creator's mind like oh oh my goodness like this is unacceptable area for others. You can find this perspective on uh, justice, the Rawlsian perspective, in many places from the street corner community activist right up to the chambers of the Supreme Court. For example, a few years ago, a uh, an admissions director at Stanford University wrote a book in which she pointed out that during all her years as an admissions director, she had never required students to submit achievement tests because some of those students, she said, through no fault of their own, attended schools where they could not have acquired the the skills necessary to do well on such tests. So she's trying to redress the inequalities and therefore she would simply not require such tests. The, co- the educational testing service is currently engaging in a, a renorming of test scores 
to take into account the social backgrounds and handicaps of the students so that the school will then, again, redress pre-existing inequalities. Um, why, why in this cartoon does the kid who has the hard workbooks that he's standing on uh, have more books uh, and the, the kid who's sitting on the grass doesn't have a single book. So is the implication that the kid who he might has, have a tablet, he has like a tablet, he's, he's yeah. reading an ebook. Yeah. Well, but, but yeah, but my point is you got the hard, the hard work kid. Okay. If that's hard work, uh, does that mean only those two books symbolize hard work or is all books supposed to symbolize hard work? Is the kid on the bottom lazy? Uh, and, and and that's why his his expectations are low. It doesn't seem to make sense the, that that the kid who has to go the highest is the only one who's I guess being uh, credited with hard work. Just that just the cartoonist, since you mentioned the cartoonist doing that, I, I would question what is the point of of that of that figure. And then it, you notice at the very end, now it's just a girl that's taking selfies. And then the worst of all, a total phone addict that also seems to be an alcoholic who's drinking a liquid the same color as his shirt. Applying the same standards uh, to everybody. Whenever I hear the notions of fairness in education, I think back to my own education. And I think, thank God my teachers were unfair to me when I was a kid growing up in Harlem. Uh, one of these teachers was a lady named Miss Simon, who belonged to what might be called the General Patton School of Education. Uh, I cannot even imagine that Miss Simon gave a moment's thought to my self-esteem. <laughs> Every word that we misspelled in her class had to be written 50 times, not in class, but as part of our homework. And there was always plenty of other homework from her and other teachers. And so you misspelled four or five words and you had quite an evening ahead of you. <laughs> Very little chance of listening to the Lone Ranger. Now, was this fair in Rawlsian terms? And the answer is no. Like many of the children in Harlem at that time, I came from a home where nobody had gone beyond elementary school. I still remember what a big fuss was made when I was promoted to the seventh grade because I had gone further than anyone else. In later years, when I graduated from Harvard, it, there was no such fuss. They expected me to. <laughs> well, the interesting thing is, if, if that cartoon, if that cartoon is true, he had a white teacher, which meant he was going to an integrated school in a mm -hmm. in a, a time when even in New York, uh, not all the schools were integrated. So uh, he might have had more homework, but he also had access to probably better teachers who were better paid than the black counterparts. So, and I don't know if that's true that that was a white teacher, but let, let's assume that that he had some influence into this video being made. Uh, if that's true, he's again glossing over advantages that he had. Now, may, maybe it was because maybe it was only because they, they th thought he was the smart Negro boy who who could achieve or whatnot. But he was apparently getting advantages that he doesn't even recognize in hindsight that he had. He's someone who has totally divorced himself from his formative years, and this explains why he can then turn around and slam that door that you mentioned on the the next guy behind him in line. Fairness was never an option. There was nothing Ms. Simon or anybody else could do about the fact that we came from homes uh, where we did not uh, have books and magazines and we were not as familiar with those words as people from other neighborhoods might have been. So that was never an option. Nothing that the schools could have done would have changed that. It would have been an irresponsible self-indulgence for them to have pretended to make things fair. If there's anything worse than unfairness, it is make-believe fairness. They yeah, could like college board the, apparently the, trying to do so that he knows this stuff in the future in his life. She is trying to be fair. She is trying by teaching him the very act of teaching him. She's trying to make life a bit more fair for him down the road. He, mm -hmm. again, he doesn't even see that. Yeah. Yeah. Do pretended that we knew more than we did. And that would have made them feel good. It would not have done much for us. Instead, they forced us to meet standards that were a little harder for us to meet than there were for some other kids, but far more necessary for us to meet because that was the only way out of poverty. Many years later, I happened to uh, run into one of the other kids from Harlem who w went to that same school at the same time. And by now he was uh, a psychiatrist. 
He owned a, a home in the Napa Valley and property out there. In fact, now he's uh, retired, living overseas with servants, while yours truly is still trying to make a living. <laughs> but as we uh, reminisced about uh, things that had happened in the old days and what had happened in between, one of the things he mentioned was that over the years, his various secretaries had commented on the fact that he seldom misspelled a word. <laughs> I told him that my secretaries had made that very same observation and that if they knew Miss Simon, there would be no mystery as to why we did not misspell words. Uh, first of all, um, what I would say is how would a PhD or some other intellectual frequently misspell words? That's just like a, a very weird kind of situation uh, to begin with. Secondarily, uh, if this guy with servants and you know retiring in a beach somewhere if he's frequently misspelling words but is also getting really really rich talk about fucking like unearned riches right you know to get back to floyd mayweather um i don't think it's a low blow to make fun of the fact that he barely seems to know how to read or write because it's a low blow if it's the floyd mayweather of 40 years ago when he's a child and you know he comes from a, a terrible living situation. By the time that you are in your forties and you have like whatever it is, hundreds of millions of dollars or over a billion dollars, if you're still so uncurious about the world that you never bothered to learn how to fucking read, you know, you, you, like you don't, you 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 pretty much don't deserve anything. You like you don't you don't know what to do with your money. You don't know do to do with your riches, right? You're just kind of like wasting away. So that's first of all, it's a very weird kind of like uh, thing to talk about in, in that lens. But yeah, to, to get back to your point, the mere fact that he's being taught, why is he being taught? Like, like I assume he's going to a public school, isn't he? Who set that up? Who, who, who put that process forward for universal schooling in America? Because not every country in the world had universal schooling by the, uh, I believe it was in the 1800s in America. So who set that up? Who put that process in motion? That's not fair. Someone else had to pay into that system. If there was no public schooling, we would not know of a Thomas Sowell. So yeah. he gets the education. He gets the public schooling. Now time to shut the door behind him. I actually sympathize with uh, you know his comments about how a teacher should behave in a classroom, right? I do think that when it comes to you being in a classroom with children, you shouldn't give any kind of slack. You shouldn't give double standards. You shouldn't pat somebody in the head and say like, oh, you know, but I know he comes from a bad family. So I'm I'm going to give him a, a passing grade uh, on this clearly, you know, uh, failed uh, a paper or failed test or whatever. You shouldn't do that. That's obviously bad. But the, the reason why this is a bad example in general, beyond the fact that, you know, public school and all that, and he's allegedly doesn't like any of this, and yet he benefited from it, beyond, you know, all those other considerations, a teacher in a school can't do anything about your social situation. They can't help you because you have a broken family. They can't help you because you have no books uh, in your uh, uh, classroom. Although, I mean, sometimes it happens. Like, I remember one time, there was a, a teacher in third grade that felt bad for me about a coat that I was wearing. So she gave me like her son's like larger, warmer coat. She didn't have to do that, right? And that's obviously not fair. She's not like giving it. She has only one fucking coat to give and she's not going to go out uh, and buy other coats for other people. So stuff like that happens. But, you know, teachers are not there to deal with all the thousand problems in your life. They're literally there to teach, okay? So there's a tax system, there's a public school system. By, by the tax system, the teachers get hired and they help you, you know, as a child in the classroom. But that does not preclude all those other ways that a tax system and a revenue generating and a revenue collection system can work, right? It doesn't have to be just schooling. What if every child gets a library card and we do have that we have libraries so you may not have a computer in your house but if you have access at least in new york city to a library you could have pretty much anything i remember how you know wonderful it was when i first started reading as a teenager and i started going to the library i i could not fucking believe that i could go online 
I could make a request for any book that I wanted. And most of the books I was able to find a library and they would literally deliver it in a goddamn truck to my library across the street. And I could go pick it up and they would give me like two weeks before they would send it back. Let's say Thomas O was hungry when he was growing up. Well, if there's a free lunch program, that's going to help him out. If there's food stamps, that's going to help him out. If there's some means of him not being hungry in school, because if he was like that hungry in school, he probably would not have learned to spell words very well. The idea that, you know, simply because a teacher can't do literally everything for you, therefore all these other things can't exist. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, these are such bad, it's like bad example after bad example after bad example. And I'll bet you that if that great teacher of his who didn't take any pity on him as a kid uh, was worried about her pension or about uh, her Medicare after she retired uh, and she went on, on strike with her other fellow good teachers, he'd probably be the first one to, to say, fuck them, fire them all. Yeah. Or, you know, if, if uh, let's say, um, you know, the, the revenue collection system wasn't sufficient and she was being paid minimum wage. Would she give a fuck about him, you know? Like, would she actually be out there, you know, doing this, like, hard work and being strict? And, I mean, because being a teacher is really hard work, right? It's emotionally draining. It could be physically draining. Um, there's so much to worry about. There's so much to worry about even when you get home. If you're going to get paid minimum wage for that, you might not want to do that job, especially you might not want to do it well. So it's like, again, like all these contradictions, it's just like so silly to listen to that, you know, you said it's a man in his 90s here. He was a man, I guess, in his 60s. But still, like, I mean, what the fuck? Like, you need to have some kind of intellectual standards. And that's the irony. He would be the first one to sort of talk about these intellectual standards. And yet he's not meeting them in this goddamn cartoon. History is the why we did not misspell words. Now, it so happens I became a high school dropout. But what I was taught before I dropped out was enough for me to score higher on the verbal SAT than the average Harvard student, which may have had something to do with my being admitted to Harvard in the era before affirmative action was even thought of. What if the teachers had, uh, those of that era had been imbued with the... Is that really true? I wonder, I wonder if there was a nice white liberal on that committee that said, Thomas O, huh? Well... Yeah. He seems well-spoken. I like him. I feel white guilt. You know what? Fuck it. Let's bring him in. How do you, how do you know that uh, this was before the era of affirmative action? Affirmative action merely codifies uh, what's kind of in the ether already in many respects, in one direction or the opposite direction, right? He has so many assumptions. It's like so, It's so sloppy, right? So sloppy. And if he, was, if he was a high school dropout, can you – this would have been – Say, if he's in his 90s, third, this would have been around 1950. Yeah, in 1950s, is a young Negro uh, student who's a dropout go, going to even be able to get a, uh, an SAT test at Harvard? A conception of fairness. Where would my schoolmate and I be today? On welfare, in prison, perhaps in a halfway house if we were lucky. And would that not have been an injustice? to take individuals capable of independent, self-supporting, and self -direct, being self-directed women and men with pride in their own achievements and turn them into dependents, clients, supplicants, mascots. Now, the primary let's, let's purpose assume, of mascots... Let's assume that what he's saying, saying is so... I would, I would, I would argue... argue uh, uh, if he's saying what he's saying is so, um, the, these individuals are capable about that's making the assumption that everyone that he deals with is capable of making logical, rational choices, as he seems to say. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, back in 1950 or so, when he would have been applying this, would that really have been happened? I mean, seriously, um, uh, the idea, the idea here, uh, when you when you get affirmative action or whatnot, is to say. We recognize that people who are making the decisions of, of entry into college, because affirmative action was first applied in colleges and then in businesses, that 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 they are going to have their biases and whatnot. So this is why we are codifying things. This is why uh, they had uh, uh, judges having mandatory sentencing. Now that's bad in the criminal system because it it, it takes away the freedom of the judge to, to 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 look at individual circumstances. But 
but th that acknowledges affirmative action acknowledges that human beings do make bad choices they do have their biases so by 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 codifying certain little advantages for those who have obviously been disadvantages you are trying to to, to balance the, the wheels again again uh he he he, he makes he, i i have a, a a sense that that his whole narrative of his life is a lot of bullshit uh, that he that you know that that he had this wonderful teacher and, and because of her he got into Harvard or whatnot. Well, I my my guess is is that that a lot of a lot of this uh, was stuff he benefited by things he may not have even know, known that he benefited. Like you mentioned about someone on a selection committee or something. Um, I his, his whole thing is based upon people acting rationally and in the self-interest of not just themselves but in society's better interest and that's not the way people people react and that's the very reason you have uh, affirmative re uh, action is because people do not have generally speaking the capabilities to do that here and there yes but on the whole probably not and the, his lack of realization of that flaw in the human character is why uh uh, why so much of his what he says is just it it's from another world he might as well be coming from you know another an alien planet he's from uranus mm. uranus is to minister to symbolize something that makes other people feel good the actual fate of the mascot himself is seldom a major consideration the uh, argument here is not against real justice, what, what, real what equality. He what, what has he become? He is the mascot. He is he is the one black person mm -hmm. that, that even the most racist white people will turn to and say, "Oh, Thomas Sowell, he's a genius." Or what? He has become a mascot by by going to his worst instincts. Mm -hmm. The only argument is that some versions of these things are simply impossible, and that trying the impossible has costs. And, and real dangers as well. Uh, after all, the people who manned the communist movement around the world before the Soviet Union was established didn't devote themselves to this cause for the sake of creating gulags and, se and secret police and territorial aggrandizement. They did it because they were seeking social justice. But what actually happened shows some of the costs and some of the dangers of that. Most ordinary Americans still have the traditional conception of justice. And that means the people who have this cosmic notion of justice must misrepresent what is happening as being a violation of traditional justice. And therefore, they must, for example, misrepresent test results as being either arbitrary barriers to advancement or deliberate efforts to perpetuate inequalities. As Joseph Schumpeter once said, the first thing a man will do for his ideals is lie. The next thing he will do, and this is my addendum, is character assassination. Those people who disagree with those with a vision of cosmic justice must be stopped in their view by all means necessary and that of course includes character assassination i mean he's literally doing the same thing right you are against freedom right yeah. like he's doing this again he says the first thing a man will do for his ideals is lie okay well does that does this apply to you uh yeah. are, are you are you are you special here it's the same like jordan peterson shit, right like you know um you know everybody lies except me you know i i'm the one that has come to this whenever he talks about mistakes it's always like 50 years uh, in the past, right? It's never, you know, look at this shit that I, I'm doing the last 10 years. Uh, they must be bought, to use the verb of our time. Now, the people who are the victims of this atmosphere of character assassination are not simply those who are targeted. The whole society is a victim because you're not going to be able to attract into the public arena people who value their privacy, who value protecting their families from humiliations, uh, if in fact disagreements become simply grounds for smears. In a sense, the people who are caught up in the vision of cosmic justice are also victims. Because once having demonized other people, they really cannot go back to square one and re-examine the evidence and find out whether what they've been advocating has been producing the results they want or producing totally different results. And so they're locked into the vision. They have too much of a stake in it to ever or think, think about doing something different. I have a chapter in the book called The Tyranny of Visions about how, how the vision becomes more real to people than any empirical reality. A classic example was one described by Paul Johnson, uh, Lenin. And Johnson pointed out that Lenin, although he spoke of himself as a representative of the proletariat, had in fact never set foot in a working class neighborhood in any of the cities he'd ever been in, inside or outside of Russia. He had never talked to the workers and had no idea what they believed about anything. 
This is this is like uh, you know uh, you definitely you know Lenin was this kind of like you know upper crust type who you know was much more kind of like you know intellectual slash theologian as opposed to like a true like revolutionary in that way like you know getting his own hands really dirty. But I mean, come on, this is such a bullshit fucking exaggeration. He never stepped put in a work class neighborhood, never spoke to the people. What the fuck are you talking about? Like the whole the the, the whole reason why people are drawn to Lenin is because of this like. Powerful, powerful charisma. His wife, yeah, right. You know, before, uh, right, right after he got exiled, she also gets exiled because she's like organizing all these worker strikes. Uh, people are drawn to him because uh, he has a very dynamic personality. The idea that he's not going to exploit that by speaking to people, shaking hands, like it's just bullshit. He also, after becoming the ruler of Russia, never set foot in Soviet Central Asia, which is an area larger than all of Western Europe. And in which all these doctrinaire schemes from Moscow were imposed for nearly three quarters of a century with devastating results. What he was devoted to was the vision, not flesh and blood people. A flesh and blood people were a complication on the road to realizing the vision. And as it turned out, if he had to kill a few million of those, that was just so much too bad. And of course, we've seen. OK, we could stop here. I don't necessarily even disagree with this part, uh, but uh, only to only only to say that this obviously applies equally to Thomas. So, you know, so I mean, like there, there's nothing special about this it literally applies to everybody, anybody that has their own like political machinations. All of this is bad, but, you know, I, I, I don't see how this is necessarily that different from, OK, we're going to come to America. We're going to colonize it. We're going to literally wipe out 90 percent of the native population. Now we're going to bring in Africans and that's going to, you know, create its own issues. And then 150 years later, we're going to pretend like none of that happened and you know pick yourself up by the bootstraps um we're going to engage in proxy wars all around the world and nobody could stop us we're going to say we have the minor doctrine but no one else has the right to invoke their own minor doctrine i mean come on give me a break like everybody does the same fucking thing you know uh it, it's nice being from the soviet union because i could look at this honestly and, and i don't have to fall in love with any kind of ideology right because i could have a, a realist approach and if anything like so is the absolute fucking idealist here he's not the one shaking hands he's not the one in the real world he might have been in the real world at some point in his life but that's so far away that's gone right time to move on all right so maybe we could just uh, I, I don't want to do lang in this too annoying um and we already spent hours and hours here so uh guys thank you for watching this it's uh um uh it, it's been nice and for the patrons we're going to discuss israel palestine a bunch of other things some uh, uh, juicy details about um Anyway, maybe I, I'm not going to use some of the words because the words would get flagged. But if you want to see the kind of words that I would use on the patron show, that is patreon.com slash automachination or the YouTube join membership program. Thank you guys for watching this. And for the patrons, we are transitioning to the patron show now.